The Etruscan is probably the first novel in English set in Tusha, a rustic corner of undiscovered Italy, 70 kilometers north of Rome in the province of Viterbo. Nestled in between the better known regions of Tuscany and Umbria, this area is unspoiled by mass tourism. It's a land of isolated valleys, green pastures, and fertile farmland, of volcanic lakes and ancient trees, of misty and mysterious islands, of underground passageways and rugged rock formations, and lonely trails through the woods roamed by wild boar and frequented by porcini mushroom hunters. It's a land of canyons and deep gorges, with tiny medieval towns perched above where time-honored traditions and ancient crafts have been preserved, where old roads lead down through the gorge to abandoned convents and Etruscan sites. A land of boiling sulfur springs and Roman baths. And most especially, it is the heartland of Etruscan culture. The Etruscan tells the story of a woman, Harriet Sackett, an artist and trouser-wearing feminist who comes to this area in 1922 to research Etruscan tombs for the Theosophical Society. Harriet visits Norchia, Barbarano Romano, and other Etruscan sites outlying the village of Vitorchiano. I spent many months traipsing about these places while researching my novel. I was fascinated not only by the tombs themselves, located out in secluded areas of the countryside, but by the survival of Etruscan symbols and traditions throughout the centuries. This survival is probably due to the area's isolation, a condition which local people consider an advantage. Harriet's map does not represent an accurate geographical model of the territory. Space has been dilated and the places described in her diary are not exactly the way she reports them as being. The novel is inspired by literary Gothic models and by the romantic concept of the sublime in which landscape and place are really a projection of the soul. In the novel, Harriet must come to terms with her soulmate, or perhaps her antagonist, Federico del Re, who is an embodiment of an archaic culture. Her experience will be both devastating and transcendent, for the two characters represent two worlds that can never be joined, the temporal and the timeless. Who is Federico del Re? Throughout the book, he is associated with the wild boar. Is he a demon or is he a shaman? That's up to the reader to decide. The road to the tomb skirted a field of shriveled sunflowers, an army of nodding heads on stalks, bowed and blackened, awaiting harvest. There were no houses out this way, only wide expanses of tawny stubble, alternating with strips of freshly ploughed clay. Here and there on a hilltop, a dead oak or cypress punctuated the empty sky where hungry crows swooped low. Grazing in the quiet meadows were flocks of dirty sheep. Their bells tinkled as they turned their heads to stare at me, a solitary traveler on the road, an alien by local standards, 
A tallish woman, no longer young, wearing a pair of moleskin trousers and rubber boots, a rucksack swinging on my shoulders. The black felt hat pulled low over my forehead concealed my cropped blonde hair. When working or traveling, I always dress in men's clothes. To those placid sheep, I probably looked like a walking scarecrow. In the distance, beyond the brown hills, I could just see the tip of a square tower where the owner of all this land lived, a reclusive count who also owned the farmhouse I rented nearby on the outskirts of the village of Vitorchiano. The tombs I was going to visit that day were part of the tower estate, and I had been told that I should apply there to request official permission to photograph them and arrange for a guide. I had come to this remote corner of Italy to research Etruscan sites. Now the road climbed a hill where neat rows of grapevines lined the slopes in perfect parallels. The Vendemia had ended weeks ago, but a few yellow leaves and brown clusters still clung to the vines, rustling in a light wind. Beyond the vineyards lay another stretch of meadow. I had seen from the map that the meadow ended on the edge of a small canyon where a trail led down to Norkia, a sprawling city of tombs carved by the Etruscans over 2,000 years ago along the cliffs of a gorge. No photographs of this site had yet been published in England or America, and I had been sent here by the London Theosophical Society to prepare a report on the area. I wasn't concerned about the Count's reaction to my unauthorized visit. He'd never need to know that I had gone trespassing on his property. Anyway, he might be away on a journey, or bedridden, or even dead, for all I knew. Maybe that's why he never answered his mail. My boots crunched along the gravel as I gazed up at the drifting clouds. Except for the sporadic circling of crows, that lonely road seemed unnaturally still. Then, as I rounded a bend, a dog began to bark.